It's good. I need this food. You wanted to really stand up. No, I need this food. It's good. We're good. No, Let's go. Good. No this bear. is the high, the 10 habits of truly effective Jews. This is the final class of the first course of giving. Obviously, it's all like a bit experimental. Is it a good angle? It's perfect. And we need, we need collaboration from people. So whoever's listening or watching, please feel free to email umuse615 at gmail.com. I got it a few years ago. Why don't you ever use it? I don't really use it so much, you know. But anyway, let's, let's, let's focus. We're now at the 10th class. And the 10th class is a completion. This week's past, you will see the 10 commandments coming together, a certain number of 10. See the hands, Hashem made us with godly elements. 10. It's the idea of completion. Yeah? How many, ta- how many commandments were there? 10 and 5 on one side, 5 on the other. It's like our hands. So remind them. We're part of this, it's part of our essence. You know that? Yeah. So we're, we're lifting up these six habits that we studied already. We went through being proactive. Then we went to begin with them in mind. Second habit, we made mission statement. We're working on private mission statement. Maybe making a public mission statement. Edinburgh. Then we put first things first. That's the big thing. Priorities. You're doing this from 9 also until 10? No, it's now. Now or never. After that, I'm chilling. Then, think win-win. That's the fourth class. Yeah? We're just going over big time. We're going to finish off tonight. Then, pretty much, yeah, for this course. Then seek first to understand, then to be understood. That was the fifth habit. And six is synergize. Now I split it into ten classes, these six habits. And the seventh habit is what we're going to discuss tonight, and we're going to go off into the eighth, ninth, and tenth. Oh, I kind of did this with you today, right? No, you didn't. Sharpening, that was the deeper aspect. This is going to be more practical. That's why it's good that you were in that class earlier. Sharpening the saw. Sharpen the saw, which is a... Let's see what he says. Let's read what Stephen Covey, who's, thank God, has set out this system. You know, his soul's in the higher world somewhere. You know, the, that's true. No, and, you know, he, he probably is getting a lot of merit for all the positive things he put in the world. Now, listen to this. It's very important. Sharpening the soul is about constantly renewing ourselves in the four basic areas of life. Yeah, what are those four basic areas? Anyone has it a guess? Intelligent people. Family, he has social. Uh, Social, uh, emotional, yeah. Work, he doesn't have, he has physical. Uh, so it's like spiritual. Yeah. Mental and spiritual. You hear those four things, Sam? Yeah. Physical, social, mental, spiritual. It's the habit that increases our capacity to live all other habits of effectiveness. So in Kabbalah, the seventh aspect is the idea of malchus. It includes everything, everything before it. Like on the human body, it's the legs, the feet, which holds up the whole body, the whole supernal man. You have kindness, you have gavura, you have kindness, chesed, gavura, which is judgment, truth. You have, this is the fires, that's a code, and then you have your sword, this is the idea of win-win, and we have, seek to understand, then we have your sword, this is the, the combination of holiness and man, and this is the idea of synergizing, bringing everything together. And then, once it's all brought together and synergized, then we have to constantly renew it and constantly bring it to high, high levels of effectiveness. For an organization, yeah, for a business, this is what Stephen Covey says again, Habit 7 promotes vision, renewal, continuous improvement, safeguards against burnout and entropy, and puts the organization on a new upward growth path. Yeah? So every organization needs to know this book, in my opinion. Yeah? At least right. read it. So you know, you don't have to go study it, but at least read it. At least have it in the back of your mind. There's a process, a positive process. What's the next thing? For a family. You got a family? You love your family? Listen to this. It increases effectiveness through regular personal and family activities, such as establishing traditions and nurture the spirit of family renewal. So, for example, I have a mission statement for my family. I was busy with beginning with man in mind, and I see my daughter numerous times, Sam, quote those ideas and, and request to me that I live up to them. Yeah? That I live up to those. How old's your daughter? My daughter's 11. And she's asking me again and again. She's like, Dad, she's like, Tati, you know, this is, you're now not listening to the mission statement. She only read it once, but thank God my, 
She read my mission statement for the family. So, oh, just the mission statement. Uh, for what? the family. And she's wait, called wait, me on new new times. Have a good night, Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi Marty. What's it called? When's the bar mitzvah? And are we invited and will there be drinks? Bar mitzvah. Well, you know, anything to do with midnight rabbi is probably going to be a bit of drinks. But I know if the Shiva like it, we have to keep the rules of the Shiva. But bar mitzvah is my territory. What can I do? So uh, maybe when you guys come, we'll have to like hide the bottles, yeah, and uh, <laughs> tell you where the hiding place is. But the point is that uh, you know this isn't a drug rehab, you know. You know, you're not like on close down, you know. Yeah. What lockout? I'll show you. You're not. Wait, I think so you have a choice here. When she turns twelve. Anyway, twelve. Twelve is next year. So you have to come what, back in, the second year. Shana base. And like the in the vet, you're in lockdown. Cash even in the Neve, they probably need, they probably have some. They, those kind of guys they send to rehab. I've had I've just they're, they're reconnected to a guy who was in rehab from there, and he's done amazing. He's had a whole turnaround in his life. You know, I did try and help him before rehab, but he obviously had to really clean up. And thank God he's been clean since then. Well, we actual rehab. Yes. Yeah, proper real rehab in LA. Not Neve. No. In the a lot of guys end up, unfortunately, not a lot, a few guys have ended up every year into rehab. By the way, they heal, they grow. In rehab, they learn the 12 steps. We talked about that first class, remember that? Yeah. The 12 steps. All the kids, like, like, are there any, like, not, like, crazy kids Yeah, there? kids come out really good. Some of the kids no, don't like, even the know. No, but, the kids go there that are, like, normal, or? Yeah, there's somewhat normal. They, they made a, a film once, it was very funny. And basically the guys made it. And it was a more normal kid came. And you see him suddenly start to like do all these things he never did. You know, like he meets the guy in the washing room and starts getting, you know, weed. And you know, like you see him slowly like being corrupted into the way kids. So he goes from this like yeshiva kid, like learning away of all these swarm in front of him. And next minute you know, he's like, you know, sitting there in a hoodie like, rabbi, you know. Just give me space, you know, like, he's like, you know, I, uh, <laughs> it's really funny. Anyway, it was a joke. Bottom line, you've got to have a sense of humor also. So that's a big part of the seventh habit of renewal, sharpening the sword. So I'll tell you something, me personally, it's research. You have to constantly research. I think you guys are the type of guys are going to do that. You're researching. So nowadays we have the Google Ador, you can look up all sorts of things, find it very quick. I'm making a joke, but I mean the God of Ador. Yeah, we have Rabonim, we have Torah, we have endless access to information. I don't think our problem in this generation is information. We got, you know, you can study anything on YouTube. You know, someone was telling me, you need, you know, if you want to go find out how to use the internet, go look it up online. It will teach you how to use it. Seriously, I have someone who's done that and become a very rich person, has a beautiful mansion and is employing half, half a community now under his auspices. He works online with the whole ad web and, you know, SEO stuff. He work from online? He's made, made a business. That's a business. I don't want to say his name. He's become quite famous actually, so I'm not going to quote him. What's he do? He does online marketing much more than that. Even. All the new latest, whatever the latest stuff going down. I can tell you in private who he is but um, I recommend this work it's very good you know? thank God I've even had connected a few people but the bottom line is that, that that's the sharpening the sword yeah that's the idea of through constantly learning growing this this is a big key because he talks about organization and family but there's also the individual level the person has to constantly develop himself especially young guys like yourself so Something we didn't say in Synergize, which is important to know. One plus one in Synergize equals three or four or five or six. Just by joining up with someone else, if you really become creative and attach yourself to the creative element of joining up with another person, you can really thrive on these individual strengths. You can really go way, way beyond. We didn't mention that, sorry, in Synergize. I'm so just adding that in now. Um, so I was one of the things I looked up in this book about stories, the courage to change, that really inspired me. And I think that I want, I want you guys to contribute your inspirational stories that you feel have inspired you was about the importance of emotional bank account, yeah? And you see with children, there was, there was a story. You guys, have you ever had heartbreak? You've ever been broken, you're heartbroken by a girl? Yeah? I did the heartbreaking usually. Oh, okay. That's what I used to say until it happened to me. Now, no, I've also been heartbroken. So you can be really broken. It's a really powerful thing, the man-woman relationship. And if it's done in the right way, it's an amazing thing. You can build a beautiful home, beautiful reality. But if it's done in the wrong way, it can be 
you know, devastating. And even before marriage, you know, nowadays, which is very common, you can almost, you know, 99% of the world's doing this, that you can basically, you can end up with a lot of heartache. And it's a real thing. So in this story, without getting onto the parts of it, the person came home so heartbroken. And what did the father do? The father hugged the child, gave a warmth, and said, My son, I promise the son will come up again. I love you. Meaning he's going to move past this painful moment. And that emotional connection, this is what he says, such profound emotional experiences last a lifetime, give powerful scripts to the next generation. My guess is that this person does the same thing with his children as his father did with him. There's a certain continuation. So in my personal experience, my father wasn't so emotionally you know, bonding like that. More later on in life. But we... You know, he gave me stability, he gave me a lot of positive things. But what I'd like to give to my kids is to be there for those special moments, you know, emotionally, if I'm able to. So that's why one of the schedule, you know, the schedule organizer, the idea of first things first, you have to put time in your schedule, family time. That should be, otherwise, how are you going to have those experiences? If you're never around, you're so career minded, how are you going to be there for that key moment to make that all important connection that your son's heart's been broken? Like, hopefully, my children won't have any premarital like situations like this but like they, they, my son home, came home today crying because a whole group of kids bullied him yeah so that moment I wasn't there my wife had to be there for him yeah is now, bullying in Haredi school yeah of course it was a certain reason huh what are you talking about bro I'm joking you know it's, it's a joke but um a lot of this when, stuff I have a question here, right? when you yeah. said um that they shouldn't have any like premarital um I don't know what the last word you said connections was. connections do you, like obviously like physic physical like there shouldn't yeah. be any premarital but does, do you all like do you the also social aspect? do you think like there, like there shouldn't be like a shomer nagia like boyfriend girlfriend relationship before marriage I can understand do you, do you that whole believe part? only in shidduchim I, yeah, I, I hear your question. I can understand that whole part. Because I see, like, you know, there's some sort of functionality still going from that path. And it can lead to Jewish, you know, marriages, very positive. But thank God I've been, have personally had access to a lot of spiritual texts, you know, mystical texts, and seen the effects of, you know, holiness of man and holiness of woman and what it's all about. And I've seen the down spiral society and how in this area it's become the most, you know, unfortunately most abused So aspects of society. So obviously I want to set the, 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 the goal, set it, it's like this idea in education, set a very high level goal. Like you want to, you want to achieve, achieve something on a high level, do you understand? Yeah. So based on that reality, I don't want to just give in. Right. To, to what's going on out there, and I think the the alternative you're suggesting, which is to have a social scene, generally when a guy and girl and they've got those feelings, it's almost inevitable. Right. I'm married, I'll be honest. Thank God, Has Hashem, and it's still a challenge. It doesn't end with marriage. It's it's a continuous struggle, and during these six weeks, which we're talking about. There's, there's a certain aspect of, of fixing in this area. Right. So that was a big thing we talked about in all our classes we've had over these nine, nine sessions over these six weeks. We're actually, truth is, we're in the fifth week now, and next week we're not going to be having classes as far as I know. Maybe Sunday night, I think there'll be one. Yeah? One class. Just to, but that will already be in the new cycle. I'll meet my dad on Sunday. Yeah, he's coming in? Wow, I'm very excited. So that, that's the big thing. I met one of the guy's mother. It was really nice to you know, meet someone who... You know, Actually, he's you, right? produced this right. student that we can connect with and no, grow with love, and to see the appreciation uh, she has. So that, let's just read one more story, just to hear from Stephen Covey's inspirational stories. And he brings a whole important point about the circle of influence. Yeah, we talked about the importance of emotional bank account and synthesizing, joining up with other people and building trust. But there's also, you have to be very real with what is your circle of influence. Those things we can actually influence and control. I mean, you don't want to control people, but you know, have a positive influence on. And those things that we have no control, the circle of concern. A lot of things like, you know, in life, you can have a situation where you don't really have control, but you can start to try and influence certain things, yeah? Brother, we here? Yeah. Okay, so like, I have an influence right now, opportunity to influence you guys. You can influence me. We can positively influence each other. 
or you can be on your iPhones and you can influence all those other people that are uh, seemingly more important. Yeah? And maybe they are, and you can influence them. Or there's circle concern, like you have this concern, but what's going to be with this thing and that thing? And you really have no control in it. You know, like a lot of people have anxiety these days. You know, people are suffering from anxiety. So what are we going to do? If we get rid of this circle of concern, aspects and focus, but we stop worrying about things, and we start focusing on our circle of influence. Imagine the amount of anxiety saved. You won't have to be anxious, yeah? Because you're being realistic. You're being honest with the true reality. You attach yourself to what you really can affect what you can be involved with and positively develop. So now, for example, what, spending hours watching news every week. So I have to be in touch with what's going on. But if, can you actually influence that reality? Very little. Nowadays, there is an idea of having a voice, and that's why the eighth habit, according to Stephen Covey, what's the eighth habit, guys? The eighth habit is developing a voice. I'm gonna be getting that book tomorrow, and I have to read it before I can really go into it. So we're gonna to have to wait till the next course to really discuss the eighth habit. Because right now I've just be a little bit I've watched online, a little bit of, you know, I've heard from my friends. He says, my friend said when he read the book The Eighth Habit, the bottom line conclusion of Stephen Covey is to become someone who serves others. To offer service to other people. And that's such a Jewish concept. The idea of being a giver, that's the ultimate devakas to Hashem. That's the idea of becoming like Hashem, a godly person, by becoming a giver, by serving other people, the king of, I of Israel. With David and Malach, David the king, what was his sweet singer of Israel? What was he? What was his ability? Who served? Who served who? He served. He served. Oh, he served Hashem, David Abdecha. He was your servant, and thereby serving the Jewish people, because Hashem and the Jewish people, in his eyes, was all united. That's what we get to the ninth and tenth habit, which I'd like to discuss, which Stephen Covey doesn't even mention, which I want to introduce, and that's where we have the truly effective. How, yeah, the truly effective Jews. Yeah, what's that about? The ninth and tenth, uh, we spoke about today in our learning was Anochi Hashem The ninth and tenth habit is connecting to these two commandments in this week's parsha. And Loi that I am Hashem your God, and you should not have any other gods. So we're going to go backwards. The ninth habit is what? Don't have any other gods. What would you say other gods are? Yes, for our generation, money, power, what? People Sadiq can say that. What would you say? What? Other gods. What people worship in this generation? Um, Distracts them from their purpose. Money, money like Beauty. physical things, pretty much. Okay, but you know what I think even more? Like that famous comedian once said, distractions. They make God into a distraction. Like distractions become their God. Yeah? You get that? Distractions. That's what we talk about in the time, time management side. You have the third and fourth quadrant. Yeah? There's the third conjuring of things that aren't really important. And then there's the fourth one of time wasting. Right. And this generation, we've got a whole culture media, which you could say there's a level of need for entertainment. He has that aspect of social, remember in the seventh habit, of being social and emotionally healthy. You have to have a certain amount of chill time. Yeah? Very important. I'll show you we get plenty. Look, we got the schedule. Let's have a look again. I bought the schedule again. Yeah. It's mind us. Yeah? Schedule. And we have the teal, the middle pillar of the whole schedule is chill, teal, party time, you know, go out for a holiday, go and visit interesting places. We have the, uh, I'm glad you guys are taking it, that, that inspires me, because I want you guys to look at it, not just me. Then you have, you know, the lunch breaks, you have the dinner breaks, you have the, you know, there's, there's a lot of time to chill in this program. We've got a What's vacation this, next week already. Energy. That's meant to be at uh, Rabbi Wengland. Tonight. Oh, really? Or was it tonight? Or last no, night? No, last night. His series is called Simple as a Being Happy. Mm. It's a very important thing in Jewish principles. I don't, I don't know what he's saying. I haven't been to he's, his class. He's a uh, bells, right? Yeah. But I don't know what he's saying exactly, but I can imagine that the bottom line is. But is, do you think what he's saying lies in accordance with what Bell's rabbis would say? I, you have to talk to him about it. But the idea of Simple as being happy in life, this is a very, you know, profound and important part of what really Judaism always was. You know, you imagine the shtetl life, you know, the simple life of old. People were happy with little, people were happy with what they had. The son Sumer Behelko, they were happy if they were able to put bread on the table and have a Shabbat meal with candles, Shabbos meal, and they were able to, you know, sing a little bit with their friends and have a few schnapps, you know. It was a simple life and simple pleasures, you understand? Yeah. 
there's a certain, but now our generation is so complicated and everything's so advanced seemingly. So we've got advanced problems as well and the lack of appreciation. So simple a chaim is something that has to be a part of our schedule. But the key is to not get distracted by it. that quest for happiness, that quest for joy of life. A quest for happiness shouldn't distract us. Do you get it, bro? Yeah. You shouldn't become, it shouldn't become distractions. It shouldn't take away from your mission statement, from your schedule, from first things first. It shouldn't take away from beginning, beginning with our mind. It shouldn't take, take away from your ability to be proactive and your sphere of influence. Because if you can influence so many people, if you're wasting your time, then you're missing that boat. And all those people that could have gained from your beautiful smile, you know, smile, are losing it. Yeah? They're losing that beautiful smile. You know, there's, there's some rabbis who train themselves to smile all the time. Shalom Orish. He didn't naturally smile. And he got no one in his... He's a Shalom Yeah, he's, he's a big rabbi these days. He trained himself. Well, he's up. the guy that wrote that book yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can look it up on uh, yeah, Muna Channel, on. Muna Channel or Shalom Orish. A -R in Moroccan, right? Moroccan, yeah. So he, had, he trained himself to smile. The first thing he talks about in his book, the famous book on Muna, went big, big, big. Millions of copies sold. He, he trained himself to smile. He got no one before he became religious so, to someone who smiled. He trained himself. And the importance of smiling. And Even the hottest girl came up to him on the campus and said, you've got a beautiful smile, you know? And he said, he said to her, you know, like, mm, I want to tell you something. I'm on a journey. Like, he was in university. He was doing a big course, big, doing well. He said, I really want to, like, go on a journey spiritually and develop myself. And, you know, and, and the love was going on about his, you know, goals to become more spiritual. She just like, looked at him like he'd gone mad and wandered off. Yeah? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah? So anyway, bottom line, you have to have a beautiful smile. Yeah? It's a shame for her, but there's opportunities. You have certain moments to connect, to get rid of those distractions. And one of the things is, you know, with the internet culture, to, to decide what, what, you're gonna use, what are you going to look at when you go online? What's your time for? What are you looking up for? Remember, we're researching is very so, positive. Sur surfing is not. Yeah, I don't mean surfing on the sea. That's great. Yeah, surfing on the on the waves is a very powerful experience. If you ever have time, it's a good exercise, good sport. You used to do it in. in oh, the I, I watched a lot of movies, unfortunately, yeah. and I used to watch other people do it. And I was back in the day in my hippie days, but and it looked beautiful. And I did try a few times, but I kept falling off the board. So you have to know what you're good at. But bottom line. For our, see me surfing, have a picture. Yeah, great, love to see. For our, for our class, we have to work out what are those distractions, you know? Even right now, while we're trying to talk, just keep focused and keep on topic. It's a challenge every minute, but you also have to be interesting. Oh, wow, that's a really cool picture. Look at my hair there. Yeah, wow. I want to see you on that, on that, what do you call it, the wake? It's a win this is a windsurfing. Oh, yeah. I used to be good at that. Windsurfing, yeah, it looked like you had some rope there or something. Okay. See my hair there? Yeah, so, no, 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 no. <laughs> so that's that, that second commandment from this week's Parsha. And it's, we said today, we had a whole class, and I have to repeat it, about what these two commandments are, how the, cool, how the foundation of the whole Torah is built off those two commandments. Then we have the first commandment. What's the first one? Anochi Hashem. I am Hashem. This is the whole base of the whole Torah, the Munna. But what you have to know in the word Anochi, you know what Anochi is? Anochi is the words I. And it says in Gemara Shabbos, in Talmud, in Shabbat, yeah, Shabbos, it says over there, the Sefta Shabbos, it says over there, beautiful idea. Anochi is Osius. Ani, yeah? Ano, ani, ano, sorry. Ani, Neshama, Neshmasi, Kasavis, Yahavis. I, my Neshama, I wrote it down and gave it. What does that mean? Hashem has wrote down my Neshama. He wrote down my Neshama. This is what he said. And he gave it to us as a present. You hear that, guys? He's upset. Yeah. He's, Hashem he's gave you his neshama. It's in you. He, Anochi. He gave of his essence. His nest really? essence is neshama. Hashem gave it to us. Kasavis Yahavis. And he gave it to us. And this is a beautiful, the biggest guest, the gift a person can give is their, their essence. Their relationship. True relationship. You know, true marriage is becoming one soul. Hashem gave it to us. When he gave us the Ten Commandments, he became one with us. We, we, our bodies, our souls jumped out towards Hashem. We reached a certain experience on the soul level that's for all the generations. And this is why it's so important to know about this 10th habit, which is really the first commandment, because you know the 10 goes back down to the 1, the idea of bridging the highest levels to the lowest levels. This is a, a principle of Judaism that we always, it's circular, always bring everything round, Kesamalkas, from the highest to the lowest. You know, this is a very deep idea, but bottom line, that we want to influence all the way from the highest level down to the lowest. And that's really the idea of being proactive, being kind. 
being a giver really comes from the reality that you are one with God, godliness. You have a godly spark in you. And that godly spark means to be a giver, means to be good. God is good. This is a powerful thing to think about. And that's why if you have this concept in your mind as the fundamental of who you are, and you truly, once you remove all the distractions, you shouldn't have any other words, and you get to this inner aspect that's inside you, this godly spark, this, this neshama, and you get to know who you truly are. True awareness of the true Dan, true Daniel, and true Aaron Svi. Yeah, is that right? Aaron Pesach. Aaron Pesach, sorry. You get to know Close. truly who you are. Close. Yeah. Pesach's good. Mouth speaks. We talked about that once. But this idea of truly knowing who you are, and this is the key to then influence and lift up all the nine habits below. Yeah? And that is the goal. Not just to be successful and effective in this world, but to bring out the truth, the true Jew of who you are, the truly effective Jew that you are. And that's why we're taking it, we're changing it a little bit. You know, hopefully the organization over there will be happy with this. But, you know, this is just a Jewish way of looking at this very inspirational book. We're not trying to say we're better. We're just saying that we have a Jewish way of looking at it. We are Jews and Jews accept that we are involved in the world and we accept the wisdoms of the world. But we have to also know that we have a path that Shem in this week's Pasha made us have the Menugoyim. He made us separate from the Jews, from the, non, from the world. He gave us a certain purpose and that was to reveal that godly spark that, that is within everyone, it, truthfully, in the whole world. Everyone's made Salaman Akim. But we have it in the... We have it as a mission. This is our mission statement. The Hashem took us out of Israel and gives us the opportunity to know what our mission is. The Ten Commandments is our mission statement. And you know, on the deepest level. And this, this therefore elevates everything we're doing. Because the Shem's wanting a relationship with us. And he wants us to become one with him and one with the, with the Torah and one with the Jewish people. He wants a certain unity, unified experience. And that will, Mimele, that will bring. From, from come out from that to bring everyone in the world to that realization. So that's that's our that's our job. And we're not trying to brainwash. We're not trying to this. We're just trying to get in touch with an inner truth. That everyone knows deep down. It's not something you have to like, you know, persuade someone. Because it, it, throughout history, we've seen Dan. Tell me a story. You know any people in your family or anyone? When it came down to what do they do? They gave up their life for this inner aspect they can't even explain. They don't even really vocalize so much. For what? For, for sh during the Holocaust, you have relatives who ever, or inquisitions or anything. Inquisition. Yeah. So do you think they gave in or they they left? No. They left. They left. You know what they left? You know the Golden Medina of Spain, how wealthy they were. They gave it up. Everything for the belief they could have just become a, a Marano or a Christian. Why do they? Why do they say no? Why do they move on? They knew they had to protect their Jewishness. Nowadays, the world fine. There's a lot of anti-Semitism, but the world accepts our Jewishness. Yeah, somewhat. We're allowed to be Jews. They just don't want us to be in Israel and fight with the Palestinians. Not everyone, but generally. My history teacher, sophomore year, yeah. gave a very interesting explanation on like good, the difference between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, which like. It like happened in like the 1800s, I think. Okay. Anti-Judaism was against the religion, yeah. where like they gave you the choice to convert, yeah. like in the Inquisition, or to uh, accept another religion. And then like there became a point in Europe, and you could see when it happened in history, when the pogrom started, really, where when it pogroms were going on for a long time. Where it turned into anti-Semitism, okay. which was like in the Holocaust, you couldn't accept Christianity. It didn't matter if you weren't even Jewish and you had one Jewish grandparent. If you had Jewish blood, you're seen in it as inferior. And it was no longer a thing against the religion anymore. It was a thing against the race of Jewish people. Hey, but you know what all these things, experiences are pushing? They're pushing a, for a Jew, so they're talking now to the Jewish people right now. The Jew has to has to realize that he's Jewish yeah. Yeah. and that that's all that experience is there to wake us up because what was happening during that time you're talking about in the 1800s what were Jews doing? assimilating en masse the full movement was very strong the Haskalah the, the enlightenment and the goal was to assimilate us and that assimilation created a backlash which caused the Jews have to, they have to be woken up that we're Jewish we cannot escape it like you're saying even Hitler and his people Mahshimam, wouldn't let us wouldn't let us forget that we're Jewish, no matter how far off we're Jewish. And that, that is a certain realization that we must forget this godly spark within. We want it to come through positivity. We want the world to, to 
have positive education and positive experiences. It shouldn't come from all this negativity.